So our first topic is what is the single best genetically engineered technology for arthropod pest control? We'll have Auburn University and the University of California Davis debating. They've each chosen their tool that they will be defending, RNAi versus sterile insect technique. And our introduction will be presented by Priyanka Mitapelli from Ohio State University. All right, ready to start out the debates. First, we have a five-minute unbiased introduction from Priyanka Mitapelli from The Ohio State University. Thank you. So today I'll be giving an unbiased introduction on the first topic, which is what is the single best genetically engineered technology for arthropod pest control? So pest is any organism that interferes with the activities and desires of humans and it has a negative impact on human health and safety, agriculture, and livestock production. And these pests have uh, been causing many diseases and they adversely affect, resulting in billions of dollars loss. So we manage this pest by pest management programs which, where we collect the information and use further management decisions to reduce the pest population impacts in a planned and controlled way. So managing these arthropods is a major challenge because these pests cause destructive effects worldwide. But one means uh, to manage or control these uh, pest populations could be by the use of genetic engineering, which, is, uh, which has improved a lot in recent years and it has a promise for pest control. So genetic engineering involves manipulating the genetic material of a specific organism in order to mod modify its characteristics. And this technique can assist in controlling pests in various biological, medical, and agricultural settings. And this technique can also be used on a wide range of plants, animals, and microorganisms. So today we'll be discussing and comparing two genetic engineering techniques that are used to control arthropod pests, which are RNA interference and sterile insect technique. Both these techniques involve manipulation of genetic material and they are cost effective, environment friendly, and they are compatible with other control tactics. These, uh, these both techniques can be species specific, target specific, and accurate. So using these two techniques to control arthropod pests could improve human safety, agriculture, and the overall global economy. So what is RNA interference? It is a biological process in which the RNA molecules will inhibit the expression of your target genes. And this is accomplished by introduction of the double-stranded RNA into an organism which will inhibit the expression of your target gene by preventing its translation into a protein. And this is an important tool that is effective because it's effective in silencing your target gene expression. And uh, RNA interference-based, like genetic engineering-based applications are under development, and RNAi provides reliable means to control arthropod pests. And uh, genetically engineered sterile insect technique is uh, also modifying the genetic material of that organism to produce sterile males. So sterile males can also be produced by physical and chemical agents such as X-rays, gamma rays, and other anti-metabolites. But today we'll be just focusing on the genetically engineered sterile insect technique. So releasing these sterile males in millions of numbers over a wide area will uh, mate with the wild females and this mating results in no viable offspring. So releasing them in sufficient numbers over a period of time can either suppress or collapse the population. So with this, I conclude that both RNA interference and genetically engineered sterile insect technique can be used to control pest populations and yeah, good luck for both the teams. Thank you. Our next presentation will be the introduction from University of California, Davis. It'll be seven minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. We're the team from UC Davis. And in response to the prompt, what is the single best genetically engineered technology for arthropod pest control? We would like to defend the use of genetically engineered sterile insect technique. In order to discuss that technology, we'd first like to define what we mean by best. So we think there are some important qualities that any ideal genetically engineered pest control technique possesses. It needs to be cost effective. There needs to be a good return on investment. It's incredibly important. You need to have some intrinsic mechanism of controlling its persistence in the environment. 
You need to have control over its effect on the population. You need to be able to monitor that. It also needs to be species specific. There are many broad spectrum techniques available in integrated pest management, but an ideal technology allows you to target your control to a specific pest very directly. Additionally, it needs to be environmentally safe. When you're releasing a new technology, you need to make sure that it's not going to have a negative impact. The use of this technology needs to result in the reduced use of pesticides. That's a really important concern. And then additionally, there needs to be an intrinsic mechanism of resistance management, both to pesticides and the technique itself. With any technique that's ideal, you need to be able to modify it to accommodate changing conditions. So employment of new designs is really important. And then additionally, because there are pests in both agriculture and human health, and public health, I mean, the technology needs to be effective in both of those contexts. We believe that the sterile insect technique, using genetic engineering, meets all of these criteria. There's abundant evidence to demonstrate that when you combine and consider in aggregate the cost of development and the cost of deployment, a sterile insect technique is very cost effective. Additionally, especially if you use a population suppression technique, persistence is very controllable. Because SIT works in a mating system, it's inherently species specific. And additionally, because you're only modifying the organisms themselves, the pest organisms of interest, it's inherently environmentally safe. There's evidence to demonstrate that populations can be suppressed below the level where chemical insecticides need to be used as a primary means of control. And then additionally, the introgression of vulnerable alleles into the population results in resistance management. Because you can modify the organisms themselves, and they're not persisting in the environment, if you need to provide a different means of control, that can be done efficiently. And then most importantly, the sterile insect technique has been used to great effect in both the context of agriculture and public health. One example of genetic engineering in improving a sterile insect technique is something called RIDDLE. It stands for Release of Insects Carrying a Dominant Lethal Genetic System. And it's pretty straightforward. You take a line of insects, the pest insects of interest, you genetically transform them to be sterile, you release those sterile males, and the results of the mating between the sterile males and the wild females results in non-viable offspring. Now with any novel technology, there's a possible concern that its implementation might be ineffective. But there's a lot of contemporary demonstration that Riddle is very effective. The tests in the Cayman Islands and Malaysia were so sufficiently successful that institutions in Brazil decided to implement Riddle on an ongoing basis to control Aedes aegypti and its transmission of dengue. But it's not just in the context of public health where Riddle has been used to great effect. Riddle has been used since 2002 in various locations in the United States to control the pink bollworm. But the thing is, these contemporary successes are built on the strength of more than 50 years of success with the sterile insect technique around the world. Pests like the screwworm, the pink bollworm, tsetse fly, and Mediterranean fruit fly have been eradicated or suppressed consistently for more than half a century. Now, Riddle, genetically engineered sterile insect technique, is incredibly strong. But it does have a few flaws. But those flaws are not unique to it. Those concerns are consistent with most techniques involving genetic engineering. That being an assessment of environmental impact. Sometimes it can be hard to determine exactly what's going to happen when you release these things into the environment. Public acceptance is very important because that can control whether or not you're able to get something past regulation. And then additionally, with any technique in genetic engineering, because of its novelty, there are some regulatory issues associated with it. However, we strongly believe that the genetically engineered sterile insect technique is able to compensate for these concerns to a much greater degree than other associated techniques in genetic engineering. And so in summary, Riddle and other aspects of the genetic engineered sterile insect technique meet all of the important criteria that we believe essential to be possessed by an ideal genetically engineered pest control technology. And then additionally, one of the most important points is the fact that we are coupling contemporary success 
and modification on an incredibly strong technology that has seen implementation for more than a half century. Riddle and the genetically engineered sterile insect technique has a lot of strengths and it meets all of the challenges that are possessed commonly by many genetically engineered techniques in arthropod pest control. And so in conclusion, we state emphatically that the genetically engineered sterile insect technique is the best genetically engineered technology for arthropod pest control. Thank you. Thank you, Davis. So we'll now have a three-minute cross-examination period by Auburn. And if you guys look, you can see there's a clock in the front. Okay, okay great. Where you're at. All right. Ready when you are, guys. Uh, can you provide us with a reference for the Cayman Islands study? Should be in the PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay, which one? Got that. In Malaysia, too, if you can get that. Aerosol to someone. It's right here. Should I just answer? Oh, yeah, just answer. Okay. Yeah, it's Harris et al., 2011 and 2012. Also, you say SIT is targeted and environmentally safe. Are you claiming there's, there's no horizontal gene transfer whatsoever, or there is, or what would you? The technology limits itself in the environment, so you, you aren't passing genes on to the second generation. So once that released uh, individual ha has died, you, that is no longer present. Okay. Also, regarding the success stories you mentioned, uh, need a clarification just to be sure that they are not based on irradiation and they are all based on genetic engineering because of the list of the success stories you all mentioned in your presentation. Yes, all of the contemporary success stories that we referenced are based on genetic engineering, not radiation. No more questions. All right, um, so Auburn, if you want to come on up and give your presentation, we're probably at slightly past time now. Thank you, and thank you everyone for being here. So I'm going to talk about RNA interference as being an essential for pest control of arthropods and how it should be considered the best genetically engineered approach for pest control. And in this presentation, I'll briefly go over why interference RNA is a novel technology, how it uses target specificity and precision for its mode of action. We'll look at the success in its compatibility with agriculture. We'll also look at how you can integrate it into current IPM programs, as well as the advancements in public health uh, by RNA interference. So interference RNA is a common tool that's originally used to uh, understand gene expression in many organisms, things from plants, animals, fungi, bacteria. And since then, it has been adapted to many different situations, such as pest management. How it works is you start with a double-stranded RNA, and it can be transcribed endogenously in the nucleus or introduced exogenously from the environment into an organism to silence genes. Um, if it's produced endogenously, it'll be in the form of microRNA, and if it's exogenously, it'll be small interference RNA, both of which are approximately 21 base pairs long. And the sequences of these RNAs are complementary to a specific messenger RNA for a particular gene in a specific organism. And how this works is you'll have the double-strand RNA, about approximately 70 base pairs in length. It'll get spliced by a dicer enzyme into the small interference RNA, if it's exogenously or microRNA for the endogenous ones, which will be the 21 base pairs. And then those will be incorporated into the uh, RNA-induced silencing complex, known as RISC, with an argonaut protein and other cofactors. This risk complex will guide the RNAi to its complementary messenger RNA, inducing gene silencing or the degradation of the messenger RNA. And double-stranded RNA can be uh, brought into the cells in multiple ways. Um, one of them is genetically modifying plants to express the double-stranded RNA. 
Others common techniques are microinjection or feeding as well. And it will always uh, target the messenger RNA for gene knockdown and can also provide management for viruses as well. Uh, the high specificity of uh, interference RNA technology due to the sequence dependent mode of action in the just laws of base pairing and genetics allow it to become a species specific insecticide where you can target individual species. Um, it has a high percent, or due to its high precision, uh, it often will not harm beneficial insects or non-target insects. Uh, it is also just a specific solution for resistance management and can be suited to target many different organisms from different orders such as Hemiptera, Lepidoptera, Orthoptera, etc. On agriculture, the use of interference RNA can reduce monetary cost and environmental harm by decreasing pesticide use, which is a common go-to for farmers. It is also successful against destructive agriculture pests, at, such as like the diamondback moth or the Asian corn borer. Um, it can complement management for sap-sucking insects when other technologies have begun to fail or break down, such as BT. And for genetically modified plants in agriculture, they can be, you can use a vector such as agrobacterium, for example, and have them produce hairpin RNAs, which is a single strand RNA that loops around on itself and uh, it's complementary to itself, so it forms a double strand RNA and is much more stable than regular double strand RNAs that are used for this process. Um, it can definitely be integrated into IPM programs and reduce insecticide resistance by, um, by impacting the efficiency of cytochrome P450, as cytochrome P450 is often overexpressed when resistance is present. Uh, there's potential, the potential for resistance buildup to RNAi is reduced since it relies on base pairing, and it is a dominant um, effect that can also overcome things like polyploidy. Uh, the specificity could potentially be an upgrade from insecticides, which sometimes target not, or they'll target like the benefit, beneficial insects and non-target pests. And another aspect of interference RNA is you could feed it to honeybees, for example, and the varro mites that feed on the honeybees will get the double-stranded RNA, and then it'll impact the varro mites, saving the honeybees. Uh, for public health, uh, RNAi silences genes that are essential in the susceptibility of mosquitoes to dengue virus. The virus-mediated small interfering RNA delivery system can be used for the knockdown of genes that are essential for the virus to reproduce and be transmitted in the host. There has been, it's been shown that you can get a reduction of Bore Borrelia burgdorferi infection and transmission. And there have been recent successes with uh, R using RNAi against body lice, uh, ticks, triatamine bugs, and the TT fly. So in conclusion, uh, RNAi technology is successful against many different arthropod pests in agriculture systems and also vectors of human disease. As next generation sequencing becomes more affordable and more um, powerful, it will continue to improve the capabilities of interference RNAi as we get more transcriptomes and genomes for all the different pests. And in conclusion, interference RNA is reliable, novel, and complementary with IPM and should be the best, um, the best pest management strategy. Thank you. All right, UC Davis, you may cross-examine Auburn. Uh, for the studies that you mentioned uh, that had to do with the efficacy of RNAi and the control of sap-sucking insects, uh, how many of those studies that you mentioned had field trials as a component of the study? There were no field trials, but you want, you still want the number of, of studies or? Oh, uh, just the three that you mentioned. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
It was Upadhyay et al. 2011, okay. uh, Chen et al. 2010, mm. and Kos et al. 2009. Yes, so that was Upadhyay et al., which is RNA interference for the control of white flies by oral route. The next one was Shen et al. 2010. Disruption of, oh, excuse me, feeding-based RNA interference of a trihalus phosphate synthase gene in the brown plant hopper Nila Pavarda lugens. And then the third, Koss et al., 2009. Transgenic plants as vital components of integrated pest management. mentioned in your uh, slide on agricultural uses um, that it was, uh, uh, that it had, a, it, was, it had a reduced cost. Do you have a citation for the cost effectiveness of this use in agriculture? Where is it? Where is the reduced cost? Is Yang 2011 development of RNAi in insects and RNAi based pest control? Thank you. All right, for the sake of staying on time, we'll jump ahead to rebuttals if you guys are all set. All right, so each of these rebuttals will be three minutes and your time will be displayed and then we'll immediately proceed on to the next one. So Auburn will be starting. Uh, you can obviously ask them questions, but they will not be able to respond until their rebuttal period. Okay, um, one of your references, uh, Reeves et al. 2012, uh, scientific standards and the regulation of genetically modified insects uh, states that releases of RADL mosquitoes were introduced to inhabited areas in the Malaysia study. Uh, however, another paper you have, LaCroix et al. 2012 states the opposite, which is the direct, the study, the, the direct paper to that study, um, which stated that there were no human associated, excuse me, the, they, these were not inhabited areas, so therefore there was no human associated variables. Uh, and I would, I would expect that human associated variables would affect the parameters that you're looking at in these studies, which are longevity, dispersal, and mating competitiveness, since Aedes aegypti, Aedes aegypti is an anthropophilic mosquito looking for humans. I would expect that these studies would involve inhabited areas, which this one did not. Also concerning the uh, flaws of uh, your technique SIT, uh, do you have any concern about the point of delivery of this technique? And if, we, if you see the, most of your references talks about the mode of the de delivery, which are very crude compared to RNAi. So uh, what, will you, what do you think about the, the most single beneficial to um, comparing these two techniques, RNAi and when, cons when concerning the, you know, considering the mode of delivery now? Which one do you think is more effective? <clears throat> you mentioned um, the efficient deployment of GE mosquitoes, uh, citing the Harris et al. 2011 and 2012 studies. Um, and Harris et al. 2012, they originally started with uh, an area size of like 55 hectares, and then they had to reduce, they had to reduce it to uh, 32 hectares, and finally down to 16, and they mentioned that the, they had a hard time sustaining the populations because they had to amp up the population so much that it was, they went from releasing 1,900 a week or something to 3,900 to end up being 14,000 a week with the releases, and I was wondering how that is efficient and cost effective. Um, with the limitations, they constantly had to reduce the size of the area and increase the number of insects they were deploying. How would you use sterile insect technique for asexual arthropods? Oh, 
also, I would hardly say uh, SIT is cost effective, especially uh, focusing on the uh, eradication of the screw, screw room fly, which costed $10 million. All right, uh, thank you, Auburn. All right, now for the rebuttal from Davis. So we are very excited about the genetically uh, SIT because it actually improves upon uh, the classic method of irradiation. And this close relationship actually makes it so that we know the use strengths and weaknesses of this. In fact, um, we know that it reduces the costs, hazards, and disposals associated with building and running a radiation facility. And it ensures that the fitness of the sterile males will not be reduced um, and they can compete successfully with the females. And this also reduces the difficulties associated with large-scale sex separation using the riddle technique. So in sterile male release programs, the number of uh, sterile males released and their cost is proportional to the size of the population, according to Steve and Yang, 2005. And since the cost-benefit ratio decreases with the decrease size um, with the pest population. So basically, um, we have shown that the cost is actually effective um, from this. And we just wonder where um, some of your costs or if you have estimates of costs with uh, your technique. In addition to that, from a medical standpoint position, uh, we are actually only releasing males into um, specific populations. Specifically, Aedes aegypti, for example, from those studies, uh, they don't fly very far, and so you can uh, target specific places fairly easily. But my question to you is, how are you going to introduce uh, this technique into a population with, uh, you know, RNEI. Are you going to release females that are uh, genetically modified? Um, so if you could clarify on that, that'd be great. Um, also, GE SIT technology can be very short-lived in the environment because it is contained within the release organism. Um, your citation, Terranius et al. 2000, talks about the variability and susceptibility of organisms um, to take up DSRNA, um, making it difficult to evaluate weight it for commercial use. Um, also, your citation in Phytopathology News 2014 discusses this study um, where miRNAs were found in human and mouse tissues and where they were capable of um, regulating mammalian genes. And so how do you plan on dealing with these challenges? All right, I'd like to respond to some of the things you brought up about uninhabited versus inhabited areas. Harris et al., 2011, 2012, did use some inhabited areas. There are various studies that do demonstrate its use in inhabited areas. Additionally, with regard to the Harris et al. paper and your concerns about that, the kinks were worked out in the course of that study. It was a field trial. A subsequent trial in Malaysia demonstrated that they got things figured out, and then the tests in Brazil demonstrated that those concerns were no longer relevant. With screw room radiation and its expense, one of the biggest expenses in sterile insect technique in the past has been building a radiation facility that's completely obviated when you use a gen genetically engineered sterile insect technique. All right, hopefully we're fixing our technology problems. All right, go ahead and proceed to the next rebuttal. Okay, you mentioned that this uh, RNDL is an upgrade from irradiation. Uh, however, your paper, uh, Esteva and Yang, 2005, uh, developed a mathematical model to, ex to assess uh, the cost of control, the um, efficiency of the control, and I don't believe it's an upgrade because this paper states that with RNDL, you still see a lack of competitive ability of sterile insects. You still see a lack of complete sterilization. You still see insufficient sterile populations. You still see inadequate spraying because in order to use this technology, you have to get the pest population to a manageable level, so you have to spray. So you're not necessarily reducing insecticide input because this technology might not even work. And also, with regard to multiple matings, if a, mosquito, if a female mosquito mates with a sterile male and then goes and mates with a wild male, What's going to be the implications of that? Also, 
So I'd like to make a response concerning your question regarding the mode of release. Uh, SIT has been known that most of the times they release the sterile males, and but what there have been cases in which the sterile males released doesn't, doesn't are not effective. Now, considering the population that has been released, and do they, don't you think they become more pests to you know to the public compared to RNAi techniques, which just release straight to, you know to combat the to manipulate the gene, and it doesn't have much environmental uh, you know stress. Your concern with uh, the mammalian um, RNA introduction um, really will needs to be addressed, but it needs to uh, we we need to not target genes that are highly conserved across animal kingdoms. Um, so you're trying to find a more specific target area, and then when you do that with a base pairing, how it has to be, you only have one in four chances for every stop spot, and with the base pair being um, uh, that we're targeting about 20 something pairs. Your problem or your chances of that occurring in nature are 0.25 to the 20th, which is almost minuscule. Another weakness with your technology is the amount of insects that you can target. I can probably count the number of success stories or insects involved in these success stories. Success stories in your um, presentation, maybe on two or three fingers, where I probably need two hands and two feet to count the amount of orders that we uh, can cover, which include. Diptera, Coleoptera, Hemiptera, Hymenoptera, Orthoptera, Blattodia, Lepidoptera, Isoptera, Acheri, Socodia, and Nematodes as well. All right, now for our final rebuttal. A few brief responses. Uh, you're basing some of your concerns on a 2005 paper. It's been more than a decade of further development in the use of Riddle and SIT. Additionally, uh, males are released in the case of this, and so they're not going to contribute to the pest population. It's, it's sterile release of males, so it's not going to amplify the effect of anything. Also, it seems like many of your papers lack field trials to demonstrate the efficacy of your technique, but I think we have a lot to substantiate the, the, field, the field efficacy of SIT. Um, in addition to the science that we've all presented today, I also wanted to talk briefly about practicality of implementation. The best GE method for arthropod control must be one that is implementable. RNAi is a technology that has not been used a lot practically yet, and it faces many hurdles before it can be used in the field. In 2013, Lundgren and Dwan warned of potential risks of RNAi to non-target organisms, including off-target gene silencing, silencing, or silencing target genes in non-target organisms, immune stimulation within exposed organisms, and saturation of RNAi machinery. Even more worrisome is the uh, fact that traditional tests for non-target organisms will be insufficient for RNAi since we don't know the genomes of all the potential non-target species. In 2014, a panel of experts were commissioned by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to develop recommendations for the use of RNAi in pest control, and they concluded that the classic approach of developing and assembling effects data for a standard set of test species will likely not work well with this technology that's RNAi. Furthermore, since RNAi protection is incorporated into plant tissue, regardless of the actual safety of the product, it will likely raise concerns in the public similar to the outcry that we've seen against GM crops in Europe and the U.S. Conversely, classical SIT already has demonstrated success around the world in both agricultural and medical pests and will likely not face many of the same regulatory and public opinion hurdles that are the use of RNAi will face, as suggested by a survey that was conducted in 2014 by Bokori et al. GSIT is an improvement on an already proven approach towards arthropod pest control, and in response to what was said about it being a crude method of uh, control, if it works, why does it matter how crude it is? Thank you. I'd also like to point out that a large portion of your papers deal with direct injection technology as it's been used in um, genetic research on hosts, and it's really just not applicable in, uh, in field situations. You also had a citation uh, in, that you cited in your, in your talk as well as, as during one of your rebuttals, Zodi et al., uh, 2015, um, and it, it highlighted systemic um, the, the, the issues of systemic response, and you talked, and I, you used it to talk about um, the high specificity. But in the in that paper, oh, five seconds, never mind. I apologize. All right, thank you to both of our teams. It's been great listening to you. We'll now open the floor for questions. We'll go to the judges first, and we can bring you guys the mics. We're not going to make you wander around. 
Um, so if the judges have any questions, just raise your hand, we'll bring you a mic, and then we'll open the floor for questions. And Sue has a question, Kendall. So both of the teams talked about expenses of your technologies. And um, I know it's hard to estimate the expenses, but I was wondering if each of you could tell me who bears the cost for your technologies and how do you think it would affect um, adoption of your technologies? We're prepared to respond if you like. I said we're prepared to respond to your question if you'd like. I know, I'm in. Okay. Um, yeah, so one of the benefits of SIT is that it's larger institutions, potentially government institutions, that bear the cost. It's a collective cost, and it benefits everyone, not just individuals. I think that's really potent and important with regard to many spot treatments like the use of RNAi. It would be individuals who are bearing the cost, and that cost might be very high. About adoption? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Ah, I see. I think in some ways it might improve the ability to adopt it. If you are able to convince a large regulatory organization to adopt and use a technology, as was demonstrated with Screwworm, then it, it matters less if individuals are less behind it. Uh, with our technology, uh, we believe it does have a high initial cost um, as we have to research and t find the target genes that are candidates so it has to rely on high throughput. And so a lot of that will be university um, driven, uh, so funded through science, uh, you know, government aid and um, sponsorships with corporate pa partners. And eventually this will hopefully be commercialized um, by agricultural, you know, agricultural companies. Uh, whoever wants to purchase and use it. And also, as next generation sequencing gets better and more effective, the cost will essentially keep on decreasing over time. Hi. I have a question for Auburn. You mentioned that sterile insect technique can only be useful for a number of insects. Can RNAi work in all orders? And when it does work, how efficient is it in the insect you're using it against? technology is still being developed, so we have several orders that the uh, RNA is very effective against um, I'm sorry. In, in the lab, um, and they've done some, some studies, you know, microplots, greenhouses, with, you know, transgenic crops. Uh, but it will be, it is highly specific, and it is very effective against the target species. Um, Wired et al., uh, 2009, they were able to develop RNA specific for um, species within Drosophila that was only controlled that specific species and did not affect any of the other species of Drosophila. So. Uh, can I add to that? And also, if there, um, um, uh, if it doesn't cause like direct mortality, it could cause like developmental delays and stuff. So it could work in different ways, and you can also target like Cytochrome P450 to. Uh, increase susceptibility to insecticides that they built resistance to. So it can work in like uh, just different ways that wouldn't necessarily cause direct mortality, but it could limit populations from uh, growing exponentially, for example. So are you saying that when it works, it's 100% efficient? No, Will nothing. it knock down expression of the entire gene? Most science is not 100% uh, you know, efficient, but we it's com we're, we're not comparing it to the other technique that is, you know, we're competing against. And when you mention the number of others, we agree not all insect orders can be, you know, can be controlled with RNA. But as time goes on, as we get the genome of most of these insect orders, we can be able to broaden the number of insect orders that are available for control. We have a few studies where it's about 70% effective. We have actually a paper from Kotak et al. in 2013 that actually discussed a lot of um, problems that are associated with RNAi, including insect nucleases, gut pH, um, delivery method, off-target effects, 
But specifically, they also mentioned a study where they looked at the target gene, and they mentioned that there was 38% that were actually silent at high levels, while 48% to 14% of the genes failed uh, to be silenced. So um, it's not, I wouldn't say that it's 100% uh, effective by no means. I didn't know we were commenting on the other, uh, are we also commenting on SIT as well, or are we defending our own with that question? I think the question was directed to RNAi, but I shouldn't speak for the person who asked it. Oh, I said I see. <laughs> I think right. one additional thing worth mentioning with regard to the efficacy of RNAi against. We have one more judge with a question for sure, so I'm going to okay. let her go ahead and go. I see the mic in your hand anyway. Uh, my question is for sterile insect technique, uh, you see. Um, so since you're still producing progeny, they might not be viable, but you are producing progeny. Do those progeny go on to continue transmitting diseases, feeding on crops, whatever the target organism is that you're looking at? Is it still being pestilent? Uh, no, they die before they're sexually mature and can go on to contribute to the population. Well, so they don't necessarily so, need to reach sexual maturity to be a pest if they're pests in an immature stage before they reach sexual maturity, do they still? I'm sorry, I'll allow Danny to continue. I'd like to add, so um, it depends on the system, that the sterile system that's used and what the target is. For example, in mosquitoes, the uh, larvae can persist in the environment and then compete with non non-modified individuals and actually cause further suppression in the population. Whereas if you were to target an agricultural pest where the larvae is the damaging stage, uh, that would not be a good target and the genetic technique used in there would cause non-viability in the egg stage or, the, or just in the mating so you would have no viable offspring. Part of the beauty of genetically engineered SIT as opposed to the classic method of, ear, of irradiation is that we can actually control some of these things to our benefit depending on the system. Uh, I have a question for both of uh, both teams. Consider considering the fact that agriculture production is a very complex process, so pest management uh, process, uh, and uh, both of these techniques are very species specific. Uh, what is the likelihood of success in the real world, like uh, the farms deal or the crops dealing with multiple best problem. What do you think uh, in that case, what would be the best method for the pest management? Well, I think I can say right now that uh, Africa is not going to be able to pay for the costs of rearing of these genetically modified mosquitoes, uh, excuse me, not genetically modified mosquitoes, genetically modified insects to be released um, in their agricultural settings. Also, if you look at the, if you consider the compatibility of these techniques with insect pest management techniques, you know that I have to give credit to RNAi, you know, because like you mentioned, multiple insect pests, uh, you know, uh, they are attacking the plants. But RNAi has been proven in many, some cases, in number of cases to be more compatible to IPM to combat this multiple uh, insect pest compared to SIT, in, case, in which case you can be releasing multiple sterile males of different insect species, which doesn't really, it's not environmentally friendly. Also, I think uh, maybe, uh, if I understand your question correctly, with RNAi, we are hoping to be able to find some target genes that could be broadly conserved amongst many pests, and you could have a kind of generalist RNAi insecticide uh, developed uh, once you find some target genes that may be present in several different pest species to have a more broad spectrum acting, which SIT cannot. And that's where the multiple routes of uptake come in, the soaking, the feeding, the micro-injection of the, of the DSRNA, that's where... Can we give Davis just a minute to answer this question since it was for both and almost out of time? Uh, I think we're a strong believer that there's no civil bullet. I mean, let's be honest. And so the way we see it is that this is a method that can be 
used um, and integrated with uh, other insecticidal uh, methods. But I feel that because it is a suppression, population suppression method, over time you're looking at a decrease in those populations. So from a cost perspective, I think it's uh, very good to include that with uh, insecticidal program. All right, thank you so much to both teams. We're gonna take a brief break. Uh, we'll be back at, I believe it's 57 on the hour.